happening tonight in Vancouver. If we don't have much, much lower numbers than even we have today, um, it's going to be a little scary for some folks. A storm could be brewing at BC's post-secondary schools ahead of a return to face-to-face -to -face classes this fall. Some worried it's too much too soon. After a fire devastated a number of businesses in New Westminster earlier this week, we're hearing from some of the owners. We're all devastated. Um, uh, there's no words really. Uh, what we know so far about the investigation. It's difficult. Um, difficult because it was it's been 40 years after four decades of putting on great displays at this east vancouver house the family who made a happy home on the corner here is moving out it's a lot of history it's east van we love it this is city news everywhere Good evening. We begin with breaking news tonight. BC Emergency Health Services confirms one person is in critical condition after a stabbing this afternoon at Sunset Beach in downtown Vancouver. Vancouver police say they were called to the beach near the concession just before 4.30 for a call of two men fighting. When emergency crews showed up, they found a man with stabbing injuries and the suspect was arrested nearby. Several emergency crews are still on scene and as of now, police do not know a motive. Today's numbers on COVID-19 show BC is continuing to flatten the curve. In the last 24 hours, 250 people have tested positive for the virus and three more people have died. 296 people are in hospital with 97 patients in the ICU. Nearly 3 million doses of vaccine have now been injected into the arms of British Columbians. With BC set to be fully open again this fall, BC's post-secondary schools are preparing for fully packed face-to-face -face classes in September, something those going back to work there aren't so sure about. All the sorts of issues that, that teachers have been complaining about with the restart in the schools, uh, I think could be replicated at least at the beginning of the term. Uh, at the college and university level. The most immediate concern, the sheer number. Hundreds in classes, not dozens, often in theater type settings where there are no windows. Hacking them into rooms, in my case at my institution, for three hour classes um, without people being fully vaccinated or without physical distancing. I joke that you throw them all in a blender every hour and a different 30 kids get put into the classroom and then they all go home on public transit. Um, if we don't have much, much lower numbers than even we have today. Um, it's going to be a little scary for some folks. Then there's the mental health concerns for thousands of people together again after a traumatic year, many young people away from home. The big concerns as well aren't just for faculty looking at themselves, but how they're going to support the students. Fairweather representing faculty associations, including UBC and SFU, says there's concern for staff who don't have paid time off, and the provincially mandated three days won't be enough when flu season starts again. And also for faculty asking for unique pandemic needs to be accommodated. There is a loss of voice and they're fighting very hard to be heard by the administrations and some of them are more willing to, to, to listen, to hear and to um, open up those doors for the, the collaboration of it. The schools are working on this mountain of challenges COVID-19 is bringing. UBC alone says they have 100 people focused on finding solutions. But flexibility is going to be key as these faculty members and associations are grappling with the what ifs. What if the province isn't where it needs to be with case numbers and vaccinations to move to the next step in September? If that's not the case, I think that's where we have to hold BCIT accountable to adjust and the, and the public health officer to, to adjust and adapt to what may not turn out to be what they see in their crystal ball. For City News in Victoria, I'm News 1130's Lisa Yusta. Alberta's Premier Jason Kenney is predicting all pandemic restrictions will be lifted in his province by this summer, clearing the way for major events like the Calgary Stampede. Kenney unveiled a provincial reopening plan this morning, saying Alberta has crushed a recent spike in COVID cases and that, along with high vaccination rates, will allow for the loosening of restrictions. Kenney's plan comes as federal officials announced that more than 20 million Canadians have received their first jab. That's about 63% of our population, putting Canada closer to the 75% mark that officials say will trigger the lifting of many restrictions. If you have the option, I think you should uh, be open to it. 
because it's going to become a competitive force against you. While the COVID-19 pandemic has emptied many office spaces across Vancouver, BC's four-step restart plan is aiming for a full workplace reopening in September. Just ahead, what the future of workplaces may look like and the demand for remote work. It's been a heartbreaking week for four businesses located in downtown New Westminster. Two owners we've spoken with say seeing their establishments reduced to rubble after Monday's fire still doesn't feel real. For me, it seems like it's a dream. Every so often I'm pinching myself to see if this is really a happen. Paul Minhas owns the Heritage Grill, which was destroyed in the fire. He's since been dedicating his time to his other restaurant, Begbie's, which is a little more than a block away. But the loss is still raw. Oh, numb. Absolutely numb. Um, I myself, I haven't experienced anything like that either. And you hear about things, but you never think it would happen to you till it happens to you. Uh, absolutely numb, shaking. Speechless, gone words. It was just after three Monday morning when crews arrived to find the building at Columbia and Church Streets in flames. Thomas Mishka owns the Magnetic Nightclub. He drove over from his Coquitlam home that day, hopeful his business could be saved. Uh, we did not expect. I think about 20 minutes later or 15 minutes later, when I went to the back of the of the club. There is a door, metal door that leads to the electrical department uh, uh, room, the main electrical room. That was blown out and there was a huge fire coming out through the stair staircase. And I thought, this doesn't look good. He says it's a further blow to the nightclub, which has already been dealt major losses because of the COVID-19 pandemic. With restrictions beginning to loosen, they were hoping to reopen once permitted. Yes, we, we actually were thinking of if there was a half capacity thing, we were thinking of putting a plastic barriers because we had lounges where people would sit near each other. We had couches. We thought that we can separate those areas uh, to make it a little bit more safe. New Westminster police say at this point in the investigation, nothing has been ruled out. Arson has not been ruled out yet. Like I said, it's still suspicious in nature. We're going to be working with the fire investigators to determine what might have caused this fire. In the meantime, members of the community continue to rally around the business owners. GoFundMes have been set up for each one with thousands of dollars already raised. I, I found out, I didn't know about it until I think today morning or something. And uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative of people trying to help us. Part of the reason why we do what we do, it's a community, small community, but uh, extremely tight. Uh, everybody knows everybody. Uh, and and um, uh, I'm beyond words. I, I don't even know what to say. In New Westminster, Rhea Renouf, City News. Army City is under attack. What do you do? Demonstrators took over a busy intersection in East Vancouver late this afternoon in support of a group of people living in RVs along a quiet street. Traffic came to a grinding halt on East 12th Avenue and Slocan Street, right in the middle of rush hour. This makeshift RV camp on Slocan Street has been in place for months, and the city wants these residents to pack up and leave. They held signs and blocked traffic on East 12th Avenue, and people who live in these RVs say they've struggled to find affordable housing, and they've taken this step so they're not sleeping outside. We're looking for the municipality to treat people who live in vehicles um, as people with rights and their vehicles as their homes. So we're asking the city of Vancouver to set a new enforcement priority of not enforcing bylaws against people who live in vehicles. That's the bare minimum the city can do to not exacerbate the housing crisis. In addition to that, the city should not be forcing people to be displaced just because they turn down SROs or shelters and instead should be working with the provincial government to build more social housing. The residents are working with the Carnegie Centre to find housing, and the group says it'll work with bylaw officers to make sure no one is displaced. If uh, employers force them to continue coming to the space the same way, they're going to start looking for other opportunities. Workplaces across the province could be fully reopened as soon as early September. But despite BC's four-step restart plan, some companies are not planning to go back to their pre-COVID days. 
everyone is really performing the way we would have expected them, whether it's in the office or not. Prior to the pandemic, marketing platform Wishpond had its Vancouver head office on West Georgia filled with about 80 employees. But now only about two to three people are physically still in the office and the option to work remotely has been made permanent. When you put it in context of the freedom that people get working from home, being able to spend more time with their family, uh, not having to commute, the cost savings. Um, most of our employees prefer the remote work option than going back to the office. At the end of the year, Wishpond's Vancouver lease will expire and CEO Ali Tashikandar won't be renewing it. If anything, we might get a very small office space or, you know, use co-working spaces. But as we move towards a more normal world, Shivan Kishore with the Vancouver Economic Commission says physical office space won't go extinct. The vacancy rate in 2019 in Vancouver was about 2.6%. In 2020, it was about 6.6%, so it certainly increased. But 6.6% is a fairly competitive number in the global north or in the sort of North American context. Yeah, um, so that shows that while yes, we have a bit more vacancy than the pre-pandemic era, there is still a very high demand for commercial real estate. And as offices reopen, they'll need to take on a new approach. There are some very smart people in the commercial sort of estate planning that are already considering how to really adapt and reuse some of the commercial spaces and create mixed use office buildings that serve a more cross section of workers. From now until September, the provincial government is allowing a gradual return to workplaces that will eventually include small in-person meetings, seminars and bigger meetings. A full reopening could happen as soon as September 7th. As companies navigate how to best get back to business, Clear HR Consulting CC Powell predicts hybrid models will be popular. I would say more of our clients are looking at some sort of hybrid model going down the road like down the road. As companies navigate the restart plan, Powell says communication is key. Get your employees involved in that conversation of what a return to work might look like and address the concerns sooner rather than at the 11th hour. In Vancouver, Miranda Fatour, City News. And then the Frankenstein we got last year after Halloween, so he's never been used. Eric Peterson grew up in this East Vancouver house with a huge combined family who loved to set up awesome holiday displays that have brought joy to the neighborhood for decades. Uh, well, there's always the big ones, the Halloween and Christmas. Then there will be something for St. Patrick's Day, Valentine's Day, uh, Pride, we do some flags and some other stuff, Canada Day. Uh, what else is there? Thanksgiving. But the house here on East 12th Avenue and Semlin Drive has recently been sold. So after 40 years of putting on some great holiday displays, Eric's family, who were tenants here at this house, are now moving. First of all, for the last 40 years, we've had an amazing landlord. He's been nothing but great. Uh, for his reasons and valid reasons, they sold the house. It's difficult. Um, difficult because it was it's been 40 years this final display featuring a huge inflatable Frankenstein that went unused last Halloween says goodbye to the neighborhood um, I put up the sign just telling you about us moving in and why we decorate basically and what I want everyone to know why we we're leaving not that it was sold or nothing just why we're not here anymore because I figured a few people might be a little upset if they saw no decorations with no explanation. The decorations started when Eric's mom, Terry, single at the time, moved in with him and his sister in 1983. 84, she met my stepdad, and he also had two sons. They got married in 85, had my sister in 86, and then they raised five foster children, as well as us, and the decorating has always been part of what we can do when you don't have a lot. People have been sending their farewell cards and honking at the house. So I'm out here a lot in November and people would stop by and say thank you and that's when I realized how much it meant to the neighborhood and they, the excited little kids, it's awesome. Eric says they don't know where they'll go next, but he leaves a hopeful message for all those who pass by the house that decorates for everything. Uh, the last line is stay festive and remember to celebrate everything. Um, and why? It came to mind because when I decorated for Christmas, I didn't know it would be the last time I was decorating for Christmas or any like it, I didn't realize that would be it. Um, so it's kind of the idea of celebrate everything in life because you don't know. In Vancouver, Kier Junos, City News. Um, we've been conditioned for over a year and a half to be very careful of our proximity to other people. Over a year into the pandemic and a new survey shows not all Canadians are ready to go back to normal. 
Hockey Night in Canada host Ron McLean is apologizing tonight for an on-air comment that some deem to be homophobic. McLean says he was referencing a picture of a rum party that could be seen over the shoulder of analyst Kevin Bieksa when he attempted to make a joke that could have been misinterpreted. McLean posted a statement on social media today. It reads in part, first and foremost, I regret and apologize for what happened last night. If you only heard that last line in isolation, I completely understand how that misunderstanding occurred. I am deeply sorry. I've reached out to several guiding lights in the equity-seeking arena, my allies in the LGBTQS2 plus community, and to my coworkers to receive their wisdom and continue our efforts to tend to the hearts of us all. I appreciate the power of the voices who spoke to me last night and this morning. It provides a sense of possibility. It's how change works. Sportsnet is also commenting through a statement, quote, Ron McLean has a strong history of being an outspoken ally and continues to advocate for all equity-seeking communities. Sportsnet supports Ron in his acknowledgement and apology for the comment made during last night's broadcast. The comment was made during the second intermission of Tuesday's first-round playoff game between the Toronto Maple Leafs and Montreal Canadiens. Rogers is the parent company of both Sportsnet and City News. When the public needed us most, the government failed. Scathing testimony stretching some seven hours from British Prime Minister Boris Johnson's former top aide over the UK's early pandemic response saying thousands died needlessly. The truth is that senior ministers, senior officials, senior advisers like me fell disastrously short of the standards that the public has a right to expect of its government in a crisis like this. Dominic Cummings telling a British parliamentary committee that Johnson was unfit for the job and he alleges the British leader dismissed the virus as just a scare story in February 2020. So much so, the PM suggested at one point being injected live on TV with the virus to reassure the public. Cummings, a strategic force behind the Brexit campaign and Johnson's election victory, exited Downing Street late last year after a fallout with the PM. On Wednesday, Cummings shared his account of what he says was Johnson's pushback to tougher COVID restrictions. He was cross with me and for others into what he regarded as basically pushing him into the first lockdown. His argument after that happened was literally, quote, I should have been the mayor of Jaws and kept the beaches open. That's, that's what he said on many, many occasions. With nearly 128,000 confirmed coronavirus fatalities, the UK has the world's fifth highest official COVID death toll. To deal with a pandemic on this scale has been appallingly difficult and we've at every stage uh, tried to minimise loss of life, to save lives, to protect the NHS and we have followed the best scientific advice that we, that we can. Johnson rejecting claims from his former aide and defending his government that he says has worked flat out to battle the crisis. A public inquiry into the British government's COVID response is expected next year. Melissa Duggan, City News. Things like the streetcar, the subway, or the malls, it's going to take some getting used to. We've been conditioned for over a year and a half to be very careful of our proximity to other people. Over a year into the pandemic, and Canadians have learned to adapt. And a new survey by Leger and the Association for Canadian Studies shows that more than half are somewhat anxious about getting back to normal. I don't know about other people, but I will definitely wear masks. 52% are anxious to get back, and that percentage jumps to 68% among Canadians between 18 and 24. Many of them were just starting something new or finishing something new and are ready to go on to, to a next new stage, and there's, it's completely unknown. But I do think that I'm going to keep the mask. As more and more vaccines make it into Canadian arms, some provinces have rolled out reopening plans. Despite the prospects of eating out and get-togethers, Purden says many have come to embrace the solitude brought on by the pandemic. People who have high anxiety, many may have had a lot more control over their environment than typically, especially if they were able to stay home. And so they don't have to interact with people. People not following the rules. We're going to take uh, back into normal with a, a little bit of like a grain of salt, but I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. 
And Purden says it's not just anxiety of the unknown making people weary about moving forward. I think a lot of people have really enjoyed being at home and not having a commute and not having to put makeup on and being home with their pets. In Ottawa, Nigel Newlove, City News. Vancouver's news is always available on the radio with News 1130 or online anytime at citynews1130.com. Your next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Thanks for watching and have a great night.